delightful to see all of your faces. And now please welcome the Reverend Skotchka. Good morning. It is so good to be together and I am so blessed to be with all of you. I'm really glad to be here this morning. Our story for today is perhaps more of an experiment or a question. Let's imagine <clears throat> that we are all on a ship, a big wooden ship. Think of the tall wooden masts and the planks on the decks, perhaps the brass railings. Yes, we're sailing on a ship. Now imagine that this ship, like any other, needs regular maintenance through stormy and rainy days. Of course, you can't replace the whole ship all at once while you're sailing on it. So every couple of days, we replace another plank. We've got fresh lumber in the hold for this sort of thing as the planks begin to rot and get too damp. Every couple of days, we remove an old wooden plank and put in some fresh wood. And of course, the ship is always in pretty good shape. It's mostly all good. And whenever we're back in our home port, we take all that old rotten lumber and we throw it in a pile on the dock and we pick up fresh lumber in case we need any of it on the way. Now imagine that after a few years of regular maintenance and hard sailing across the seas, every plank in the ship has been replaced every single board and plank. And the question of this morning is, is it the same ship that it used to be? If none of the original lumber remains, maybe, maybe not. But what if someone came across that pile of old ratty lumber that we left behind at the port and they scooped it all up and they used it to build another ship Imagine that they put every plank back in its original spot where it used to be. And as we were sailing back into port, that ship was sailing out and we ran into each other. Which ship could say that it was the original ship? Ours with all fresh lumber, but the original crew of sailors or this more recently constructed one of all original lumber that had been moved out from around the sailors? Well, if you don't have an answer, that's okay. This is one of the oldest thought experiments in Western philosophy, and surely some of you are familiar with it. It's called the ship of Theseus problem, and there has never really been a good solution to the ship of Theseus. Philosophers and theologians have come up with all kinds of answers, all kinds of opinions, one might say, but none of them really has won out. And if we think about it, it can be applied to many aspects of human life. It's been said also in a related fashion that you can't step into the same river twice. Each time you step into the river, all the water has changed. It's no longer the same river. But imagine having a picnic every year with your family on the same beautiful shady bend in the river under the same old oak tree that you remember. What if after 20 years we could say that, well, none of the water is the same. Perhaps the old oak tree fell down and there's a new oak tree in its place. None of the blades of grass are the original blades of grass. Are we still picnicking? at the same spot? Well, it would be pedantic to say no because the whole family still knows where to meet. They can still recognize the spot. And yet there's a real philosophical problem there. If it's not the same spot, how do we know where to put the blanket? But how do we know that it's the same spot when all of this stuff has been replaced? And what about ourselves, our human bodies? with our cells being replaced constantly, such that none of us is made up of the same cells that we started out with, however long ago that was, are we still the same people? Is it enough to have the same captain piloting the ship, as it were? 
that's the question for the day. And it has real religious implications, but that, that is for you to ponder. That is our story for today. Please join us, join me in singing our meditation hymn. You may turn your videos on and change to gallery view if you would like, but leave yourself muted. We're going to sing Return Again, which some of you already know. Each line is repeated twice and we will sing through it twice. Return again, return again. Return to the home of your soul. Return again, return again. Return to the home of your soul. Return to who you are. Return to what you are. Return to where you are, born and reborn again. Return to who you are, return to what you are. Return to where you are, born and reborn again. Return again, return again. Return to the home of your soul. Return again, return again. Return to the home of your soul. Return to who you are. Return to what you are. Return to where you are born and reborn again. Return to who you are. Return to what you are. Return to where you are, born and reborn again. Om. Thank you so much, Marie, for leading us with the gift of music. As we are pondering today what it means to return to who we are, whatever that is, at this new year season, have you ever discovered something online that's just so fascinating and new to you that you fall down the internet rabbit hole and wind up reading the entire archive of something unlikely. And the next thing you know, you're the world's foremost expert in how many different types of toucans there are, or you've read the entire history of, I don't know, bread or something. Maybe it's just me, but this happens to me with some regularity. And it's what happened when I discovered the stuffed animal hospital blog. Formerly a children's librarian, Beth Carpus has been a doll maker now for over 30 years, and she specializes in extreme stuffed animal repair. I'm talking about some very delicate, old, and precious stuffed animals. And since 2014, Beth has been documenting a few of the most drastic cases every month, and she's been posting the progress photos online. Her patients at the Stuffed Animal Hospital are all over the map. Oliver the Otter, Raj the Tiger, Heartbreaker the Hippo, an owl held together by safety pins. Many of these stuffed animals, as you can imagine, have been shredded to pieces by the family dog, another run over by a lawnmower. Musty and snuffles, damaged in flooding from Hurricane Harvey. A roadrunner with a broken tail. One of the oldest, a teddy bear from 1927, whose paws had worn out. In short, anywhere the human heart could go. 
these animals reflect it. Something unexpected shines through in this blog, which is how much these objects, these inanimate objects mean to their owners. So much so that they don't seem to be treated like objects at all. Often people will send their stuffed animals to the hospital with another stuffed animal who's actually doing just fine to keep the sick one company while it's in transit. This is a regular occurrence at Beth Carpus's workplace. Children send their stuffed animals with letters and hand-drawn illustrations of them and the stuffed animal together, saying things like, come back soon, snaky, or they send a little blanket in the box to keep their stuffy warm. Some poke air holes in the cardboard shipping box. Adults do this too. According to Beth, many adult customers say things like, I know it's only a stuffed animal, but it means the world to me. Or if I had to save one item in a fire, it would be my teddy bear. Or I'm 65 years old and this doll is one of my most treasured possessions. It seems that carrying forward a part of the past, sometimes a beloved part of a very distant past can be a precious rarity to humans. How much has any of us saved from our childhood and how much more precious it becomes to us as we age? Well, even if the fur can be salvaged, most stuffed animals wind up needing a total stuffing transplant. But some of them also wind up needing a total fur transplant. They need all or most of the fur replaced. So as you can imagine from our story, this can be existentially distressing to the owners. Is Inchy the stuffed inchworm really still Inchy? If all of his fur has been replaced and all of the stuffing, really? Well, Beth takes extreme care to involve the owners in every step of the repairs, making sure that they themselves choose which fabric Beth never chooses for them. They have to choose which fabric is closest to the inchy they remember from childhood. And they decide whether and how much to replace. Sometimes they say, no, I love my bear's tattered ears. Don't change those. They get to decide. And being able to make those decisions does seem to help, but there's something else Beth does that I found fascinating. Whenever there's an animal that she does extensive repairs on, Beth will take some of the original stuffing and she'll stuff it inside a little heart that she sews closed and then puts deep inside the middle of the new reconstituted stuffed animal. Now, when I first saw this heart solution, I thought, oh my God, she solved the ship of Theseus. 2000 years of philosophy and Beth Carpus at the stuffed animal hospital figured it out. Thank you for bringing a part of my past back to life, wrote one owner of a 50 year old rainbow dragon who was now breathing all new flames made out of red and orange felt out its little dragon mouth, but had a rainbow heart of its original stuffing deep inside. It seems that for the thing to be the same, it doesn't necessarily have to have all the same materials as the past or even most of them. What it needs is to carry forward something of the past in its heart. It has to preserve some essence of its identity at its core so that someone who remembers can believe emotionally that at least as far as it matters to them, this is the same dragon. Think back to our ship example. So many arguments about the ship of Theseus are wrapped up in the wood and the wood being changed. How much wood has to change before the ship is no longer the same? 70%, 75, 80? But what about the sailors? 
Think about the sailors. What if they never got off the ship? Even as the boards were slowly replaced around them. What would they think? Could you convince the sailors, really, having not stepped on land in however many months, that they were no longer on the same ship? When they still climbed into what looked like the same bunk every night? and every day climbed the same ladders and sat at the same breakfast table, as far as they knew. What about if they chose the boards and they subsumed this changing appearance of the ship into their understanding, their experience of what it was, and it reflected their lived experience over time? Or the person who picnics every year at the same beautiful shady bend in the river forming new memories each year of how this tree leans or what colors the flowers now are. Is their experience and memory and observation not the heart of continuity in the changing landscape? What about a church? A church where new members constantly join and old members fall away such that any year the church body might look totally different than it did 50 years ago or 100 years ago, where the building might be renovated every few years or the church might even move, where the hymnals become out of date and we no longer sing the same ones. Doesn't each of us serve as the beating heart of continuity in the living tradition of our faith? testifying each of us to the fact that the church has changed we remember it changing and yet we can say it is the same this is my church truly then to journey forward with a group of people for however long those people just those people from that time that is a special privilege even through a pandemic the most unprecedented year we also just made it through the winter holiday season, one that will likely not be forgotten. But it's always a time that can prompt a kind of poignant, sometimes difficult realization and reflection as we remember the holidays of the past necessarily and take note of who was there then and who's no longer here. I asked my Uncle Harry once, when I was a child, about his aunts and uncles. What were they like? I had never met them. What were my grandparents' siblings like when he was a kid? And Uncle Harry told me something out of the blue that might actually not be true for you, but I do believe it was true for him. He said pretty unexpectedly for me, you know, the best time of your life is when all the aunts and uncles are still alive when everybody who was in the world when you were a child is still in it and you still assume they always will be, when you know everyone there is to know on earth, the entire cast of characters, and you're sure of your place in it. Uncle Harry died in 2016. And I've often thought back to what he told me and what it means about who we are. Are we still ourselves when the people we're surrounded by have changed? When the people who remembered who we were when we were younger are no longer there to remind us? Is there some heart of continuity we carry within ourselves and physically, as the very cells of our bodies are replaced. Are we still the same? In the philosophy of mind, that's a big and enduring problem, whether we're the same people as in the past. And I think the new year is a great time to think about these things, to take stock of who we are, where we've been, where we are now, where we're going, who we were, who we still are, who we want to be, what planks in the ship we think it's time to replace. What heart of stuffing we want to hold on to.
I'm reminded in all of this of the Buddhist concept of anatta, the non-self, the idea that there's no fixed, permanent, or unchanging self, because everything, including us, is always in a state of change. It's something we can count on. And I think that perhaps one of the understated joys in life is the privilege of being able to witness the ebb and flow of identity in ourselves and all things through time and the sacred blessing of memory. I return often to the Alan Watts quote that we are the universe perceiving itself. And I think that through each line of continuity that there is, and that each of us is, each fragment of the divine whole of existence, each corner of the changing universe that we have the privilege to observe becomes holy. Now to get very nerdy for a moment, and this is where you might refill your coffee if you're not a theology nerd. In process theology, which has influenced modern Unitarian Universalism in many ways, process theology holds that objects like a stuffed animal or even entities like a human are not fixed in time, but can be considered processes or events. Each of us is an ongoing process through time. A human life is an event where material comes together in the shape of a human, does stuff for however many years or decades, hopefully, and then disperses again the event having been completed. Material coming together as a concrescence. In each of us, some molecules come and go every day, the cells are replaced, but still we hold together as a concrescence as long as we do for the duration of the event. In process theology, every table and chair is also an event, just a more boring event. Before that concrescence, the shape of a table or a chair dissolves. Nothing remains the same forever, just as in Buddhism. And I think from that perspective, the ship of Theseus problem is not really a problem. It's just the natural state of things. But, and here I find great comfort, in process theology, when an event has concluded, when the materials, however they've changed and come together over time, when those materials have stopped changing and have dispersed, when the concrescence no longer holds together, the fact that it happened is entered into a kind of divine archive of what will always have happened and never not have been. It's a kind of immortality, if you will, which means that the chance to experience anything for however long, the chance to witness the little changing of the planks in the ship of existence is an incredible gift. We are, after all, the universe perceiving itself. And as a little aside here, if you'll bear with me, I want to say, that the implications of this kind of universalist theology of experience definitely fuel our justice work as Unitarian Universalists. Because if every experience, every human experience is sacred, then religiously we cannot let a single human life be crushed into the dust. It dishonors existence and goes against our faith. It would mean, for instance, that laws oppressing transgender people. The laws themselves would be a kind of sin from that perspective, not the old way Christians might understand sin, but a sin in that they restrict the human possibility of growth, of change, of flourishing into one's truest self. They stifle one's sacred right to blossom around a heart of continuity that is experience. So Unitarian Universalism, we must always remember, is not a social justice club that happens to meet on Sundays. It's a religion whose theology 
demands justice. But personally now, at the new year, how will you flourish into the truest version of yourself at this point in time? How will you honor the experiences you've had and carry forward a heart of continuity? What will you choose to hold on to? Which old planks will you finally replace? Which new ones will you welcome into your understanding of self? Which rabbit holes will you fall into, learning about every species of toucan or the history of bread? Or what childhood treasures you will retain or find out that your fellow travelers hold tightest? My New Year's wish for each of you is that this be another year of exploration, a year of sacred seafaring aboard a ship of your own making together. Amen and blessed be. I invite you now to join in singing hymn number 128 for all that is our life. And remember that even though you cannot hear your fellow church members, they from their own homes have joined with you and you are singing together. For services we give, for work. 